Hey gang, I hope you're doing well. It's your boy, Wes. Yeah, hope you're doing good. I uh, got a drink right here. Got a new fancy creative director sweater, which doesn't make any sense. Um, we actually just found this at the store. It doesn't even have like a company that made it. It's just a white hoodie that says creative director, and it made me laugh, so I bought it. Anyway, this is the first episode of something called Ask Wes. Either Ask Wes or Ask Wes about art. I'm not sure yet, because I don't know if I want to just keep it just art focused or just kind of, you know, we're not going to talk about like birds and the bees or nothing, but you know, video games and comics and all that stuff. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But this very first episode, we got a doozy planned for you. Um, they're all art related questions, and I have 15 of them to go through. So these are from uh, YouTube. Uh, these are also from my patrons on uh, Discord, on the exclusive Patreon channel that we got there on the Discord. We also got Twitter, um, just some random DMs, all that fun stuff. So yeah, without further ado, let's just dig right into these and get going on the very first edition of Ask Wes. All right, so we are here. So if you're brand new to the channel, welcome. And uh, let me just give you a little background about myself. Uh, my name is Wes Gardner, and I am a freelance illustrator and artist that works in the entertainment industry. So I have credits including TV commercials, um, card games, tabletop role-playing games, most notably Warhammer 40K, Wrath and Glory. Um, I've worked for Adidas. I've worked for DC Comics. I've worked. I've had work published in Imagine FX Magazine. I have my full kind of career rundown in the um, advice from my first year of being a freelancer video. So I won't bore you with all the details, but just know I do have a lot of people commenting and qu have questions. So I felt like doing a video like this might be a lot of fun because someone might ask a question that you had in mind as well and to get a professional illustrator to answer those. So this should be an ongoing series. Feel free to send me questions at any time and just give me a heads up. Hey man, I want this on the next edition of Ask Wes and we'll make it happen for you. Uh, but without further ado, let's get going. So we're going to go first over the patrons um, on the Discord channel. They get first dibs always. And if you don't know, you can actually join my patron uh, my Patreon, I should say, to become a patron. And the link to that's going to be in the description. I believe it is patreon.com slash Wes Gardner or Wesley Gardner. One or the other. I'm going to put the link in there. So it's only $1 a month forever. Like, I will never raise the price. I will never pull like a switcheroo, nothing like that. It's a $1. You get brushes, you get tutorials, behind the scenes stuff everything i just have a patreon as kind of like my mailing list and i want to give you guys some exclusive stuff so psd files and basically access to private servers and stuff like that to be able to chat with me and hang out one dollar a month that's it forever in perpetuity uh so we hope to see you there but let's get started i'm also going to have the question down here we have 15 of them to go through so I'm gonna be succinct with them, but if some of them take a little longer, I do apologize, but I wanna make sure everybody gets kind of an answer that they might be looking for. So first off, we have from the Discord channel, Taz, and um, she mentions, hey Wes, uh, as a portrait artist, I am good at capturing a realistic likeness of a person. However, I really enjoy original digital art, but I find it a bit more of a challenge to tap into my imagination for digital art. I'm not lacking in imagination. I have a great imagination. I just find it challenging to use that imagination and come up with concepts for digital art. Do you have a routine or a ritual or a process that you do to tap into your imagination for your concepts behind your original or personal pieces? If so, what is it? So Taz, thank you so much. Uh, she's an awesome patron. Just joined the server not too long ago. Wonderful question. And something that I kind of battle with as well is imagination. Um, I've always considered imagination not overrated, but misunderstood. In my opinion, creativity and imagination doesn't necessarily mean what craziness can I think up. It's more of how can I successfully solve a problem. This is going to be kind of a theme throughout a lot of these answers. I'm a very big fan of using art to solve a problem, whether it's a design problem or a storytelling problem or like 
colors or mood or if there's a if there's a problem that I'm having with a piece and I want to get a certain message out or kind of an emotion or what have you, um, I try to find ways to solve the problems and that gets me going. So here's a great example. So here's someone that's a lot like myself. Uh, Taz is very observational in her artistry. She can see things. She can put what she sees down on paper. Very figurative, very um, observational, representational. You see it, you put it down there. So whenever you start getting into more of the concept, imaginative, realism type stuff, it's a different muscle in your brain. And um, I highly recommend, I know I have the book somewhere, um, I highly recommend um, Imaginative Realism by James Gurney, who, you know, he sent me a signed copy, no big deal, no big deal. I promise this is not a shill, by the way. <laughs> I was just so stoked to get a signed copy by him. Um, but it, what what he talks about and something that I, I fully agree with is take something that you have a pretty good understanding of or know what it looks like, put a slight tweak on it. So he, James Gurney's very famous for Dinotopia. Dinotopia, basically, he has this nice, beautiful, like Aztec um, realism look with dinosaurs in there. So he took one known entity, like Mesopotamian, Aztec, um, design sensibility and then added something else so it's like take something that you're comfortable with maybe a portrait but then like zombify that portrait you know what I mean like put put all your skill into making it look like the person and then ask yourself what would it look like if their nose was gone not just erase the nose but like actually put in the form and so you're using both sides you're using your observational side but then you're also having to use your creative, imaginative side. But I will say, use reference on that as well. So don't just work straight from imagination, unless you really want to flex that muscle and try to see how good your visual library is, uh, meaning how well do you know something from memory. Uh, spoiler alert, people don't really remember all that much about specific details. Like if I tell you to draw a bicycle, You'll get it pretty close, but I guarantee you're either missing the handbrake or the chain or the, the spokes on the wheel or the way that the nut and the bolt hold that you're missing something. You know what I mean? And it's hard just for our minds to get all the details. So always have reference, but mix your references. Another great method, and I do this a lot, by the way, um, take three different deals. So let's say you want to make someone in a beautiful landscape or it's a fantasy painting and you want them to be in a pose and all this other stuff what i would recommend find one landscape reference then find what i consider a color or a mood reference so you're not going to be really taking a lot of the actual stuff that you see in this picture but let's say the colors are really good or the way they do brush strokes is something that you really enjoy and then take the additional thing so what you're going to do is essentially bash these three ideas together. So you can take this landscape painting, put this other thing in there, and then paint it in the style of the middle one. Does that make sense? What that's going to do, once again, it forces you to use all those parts of your brain. So you're doing the observation because you're seeing the light and the shadow and the, you know, the way the ambience is playing off of this landscape or what have you. But then you have to integrate something into it and make it look natural. So you're essentially photo bashing. You know, at that, at that, but that's what concepts artists do. That's what imaginative realism is, is you're taking realism, adding something that wasn't there to begin with, but then to really study it and really understand it, use the color palette or the brushstroke style or something of that mood piece. And you're really going to start seeing your brain has to work harder, but you're going to be happier with the result because it's coming. No one else made that combination, but you. So in my opinion, that's imaginative. You just use your imagination um, and you're able to use your strength, which is observation, and make something really cool that's distinctively yours. No one else is going to make it, so why not you? But thank you so much, Taz, for that one. That's a great question and hopefully that's a fun exercise. Does, you don't have to change the world. You don't need to make some big billboard sized art on an IMAX screen. It ain't about that. You could take a still life and add an apple that wasn't there and then turn it from day into night just a fun exercise it's going to flex those muscles in your brain get you thinking and then you're going to start realizing that you can approach 
more uh, deliberate, weird stuff with more confidence because you know you have the ability to take a thing, put it with another thing, make it look a different way. It's all going to start building that confidence, and I think that's part of it. But yeah, good luck. I can't wait to see what you make. Um, so thank you, Taz. Moving on, also on the Discord, our good pal, I believe it's, there it is, Sunny June. So Sunny June has two. I'm going to read both and then go over them one at a time, okay? So Sunny June asks, two questions for me. They both deal with feelings that I'm sure artists of all skill levels face. Number one, what advice do you have for a beginner that feels like they'll never reach the skill level that they desire or see from others? And question number two, when a professional artist feels like they've plateaued or are frustrated with not seeing substantial improvements in their artwork, what are some healthy ways to combat those doubts and angers? Great question. So number one, what advice do you have for a beginner that feels like they'll never reach the level or desire that they, uh, the skill set that they see from others? I'm going to tell you something and it's going to sound really weird. The fact that you can see other people's art and realize that you have a ways to go to get there is nothing but a good thing. It means your eyes are very well trained. You know what you want. You know what looks good when you see it. But for whatever reason, your skill ceiling is not there. There's a there's a graph, and I'm going to post it. I posted it on the channel before, but it's a very famous one. It's based on the Dunning-Kruger effect. But basically, there's two parts of the coin whenever it comes to being an artist. One is your eyes. Like, how well do you see the world around you or see other artwork and appreciate it? And the other is your skill level. Um, how, good it, uh, how good are you at finding that balance of being able to integrate that into your own work? And what ends up happening, and this happens for your entire career, and I know this happens for any type of creative career, so a music composer, a musician, um, writers, they all go through this, anything creative. Your ability to see is going to start up here while your skill to be able to do it is down here. That's Everyone starts there. And then as you start practicing, you're doing some fundamentals, you're doing some light studies, you're going to start getting up there. And then you're going to kind of even out. Your eye and your ability are going to be even. And you'll know this happens because you'll start saying things like, man, this is the best thing I ever made. I don't know if I can make anything better than this. I need to frame this, man. This is looking good. Your eyes and your ability are neck and neck. And then what's going to happen? Your abilities go more than your eyes. And you're like, man, I got this art thing figured out, dude. Whoo, boy. Look at me go, man. I'm, the, I'm just cranking them out. Everything I make is just mwah, chef's kiss. I'm going to be on the cover of these magazines. I'm going to do all this stuff. And then what ends up happening is you start noticing more mistakes in your work because your eyes start getting better. You're able to notice things like changes in saturation and shadows or the way certain materials are rendered. Or you're going to be able to see master studies in a different way. Like, oh, now I really see those brushstrokes of Ander Zorn or John Singer Sargent and I understand what they were going for. Then that's going to start coming back up and then this is going to start happening again. And you're going to be like, I'm never going to get to that level. I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to get there. And then you start studying and then those studies start bringing you back up. And once again, that's always going to happen. So the fact that you're asking that question means you're on the right track. So I would say kind of keep at it. Art is time. Getting better at this stuff, it just takes time. I wish there was a quick way to do it. I've seen students jump into the really advanced stuff like photo bashing and all that. And hey, look at this. And it's fine until you know what to look for. And then you can tell right away that somebody's just starting. Like start on the really hard stuff too. Like, oh, I need a big battle scene. I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of Warhammer. So I'm going to make a thing where like five space Marines are fighting the Xenos army and like all the calm down, bro. Like that's the type of stuff they will pay you and give you six weeks as a pro to do probably 10 weeks. You know what I mean? Like it, it calm down that what's that old saying? Every skeleton on uh, Mount Everest was a inspired person. <laughs> so maybe calm down a little bit, um, <laughs> which is great advice, I guess, for an advice video. But really what my point is, is just hang in there, hang in there. You're going to get there. Do some master studies. If you're really like, man, I can't believe how good Greg Rutkowski does brush work. Man, he's amazing. 
do three Greg Rakowski master studies. Go ahead and do them because you're going to start thinking in that way. And then you're going to notice the differences between yours and his. Or if you're like, man, Cynthia Shepard, her, the way she does faces, even traditionally or digitally, doesn't matter. It's just perfect. I want to, I want to nail that down. Do the studies. Do absolute master studies of Cynthia Shepard. Any of your favorite artists, go ahead and do it. Try to do it and mimic it in the style that they did. You're going to learn a lot. It doesn't have to look good. That's not the point. The point is you're going to see where you're at in relation to where they are. And then as you start getting closer to that goal, what you're naturally going to start doing is deviating a little bit, which is good because that means you're finding your own style. Um, it's a natural progression. Trust me, just have faith. You're right there on the cusp. Like I've seen your work on the Discord. Great stuff. And like you're right there on the cusp of finding out what you really want to do. And I say just keep pushing forward. Question number two from Sunny June. When a professional artist feels like they've plateaued or are frustrated with not seeing substantial improvements, uh, what are some healthy ways to combat these feelings? So I'm glad you said healthy ways because the unhealthy way is to like throw in the towel and oh, I'm never going to be as good and no, oh, I've all my art's crap and burr, 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 burr. And that's not productive. It just doesn't do anyone any favors. It makes you feel bad. You're less likely to want to improve your art. You're less likely to want to do art. Especially if you're doing it for a job day in and day out, you have to find a way to stay motivated, um, which, and we'll talk about that in a, in another question in a minute, but the best ways to combat that, try something completely different, completely different, whether it's, oh, you're kind of bummed out about your drawing skills, learn Blender, learn 3D, even if you have no interest in 3D, learn 3D. Um, I'm not saying like master it overnight or anything, but like mess around with it. Oh, you're, you're, you're not good with 3D? Well, try animation. How did Walt Disney, how do, how do those classic animators, how do they make life in a person? B something that I've literally been doing. Let me grab something here. Um, I've been focusing a lot on my brushwork, but digitally. But since I got kind of bored of it, I was like, you know what I should do? I should bust out oil paints. So on my, on my, uh, yeah, I got water soluble oil paints and like just broke them back out. And it's like, Hey, it's not my best stuff, but you know, I'm going to fill up all 30 pages of this with oils. And I think it's a lot of fun. I think it's cool. Um, it's going to help. It's going to help me refine my, my thoughts and my, how I approach something in the digital but then my digital work will also help me with my oils. So shake it up, shake it up so much, shake up your process so much that you're keeping yourself guessing. Your brain's gonna activate. You're gonna be like, okay, I know how to solve the problem of ambient perspective and um, the, you know, the atmospheric perspective and pushing things back and stuff, but how do I do it if you're inside? Well, maybe I should just build it in 3D and see. You're gonna start asking different questions. And once again, it comes down to problem solving. It sounds like the problem is you're not pushing yourself enough. You're not, and this is what I tell myself. If I'm getting bored, I need to do something vastly different. I need to, you know, practice more guitar. I need to break out my keyboard and like learn more scales and stuff. You know what I mean? Use creativity, but do something that's not the thing that you're having the rut on. I, I do believe in artist block, but I think artist block is something that's very easily jumped across because you have to think bigger than what you're doing. You just have to, you have to do something else. Um, you know, if this is physical fitness, I've heard a lot of people, Hey, if my art's not going right, that's whenever I'm going to train to do my marathon. That's whenever I'm going to go weightlifting. That's when I'm going to go my martial arts, jujitsu class, whatever, like shake it up, but use that same mental capacity that you're approaching with your art on your other hobby or what have you. Learn how to speed run a video game. Learn how to, you know, there's so many things to do in life that the more you do of the other stuff, it actually enriches your art. I know that's probably not exactly the answer you maybe have wanted from that, but just know, really, if you're not seeing substantial improvements, it means you're not pushing yourself. And it doesn't have to be stressful. You don't have to be sweating buckets, but just know, okay, there's something there's something to this if i if i try something 
I have never done before, I'm going to learn something. It may be terrible, it may be bad, but I'm a big believer that you learn more from your failures than you ever do. Um, remember this saying, remember this saying right here. Professionals have failed more than amateurs have tried. Remember that. There's so many, fa I, oh man, and I'm excited because of how many more failures I'm going to have in the future. <laughs> like, I'm just getting started on my failures, man. Like, you got to embrace them. You have to know because that's how you're going to learn. And if you stay humble, if you stay hungry about that knowledge, you're going to you're gonna rule the world. So thank you, Sonny June, so much um, for the questions. Two rock-on questions, man. So now we're going to be moving over to the Twitter, the Bird app. Um, a lot of great artists asking questions, um, Taz and Sonny June and... Now we got Andrew Horton here um, on Twitter asking, how do you currently make art a fully sustaining career? Where did you get your start? So I do answer a little bit of this in the uh, advice from one year of being a freelance artist. However, I wanna talk numbers right now. So I used to do tech support, um, used to be head of tech support at a, uh, at a college. And then because of the COVID stuff and positions and glass ceilings and just, there's a lot of changes happening there. Um, the, the the school and I discussed, you know, me leaving and stuff like that. But ironically, they never rehired for my job, which means I was probably on the way out anyway, um, which I had a suspicion. But um, that's neither here nor there. I could do a whole video about that. But literally, no, know this. My income got cut into more than a third per year. A third. I'm making less than a third of what I was making as a 40 hour a week, you know, insurance paid, you know, really good benefits and all that stuff. Like, that ain't it no more, man. So, this is where I'm going to say a support system is necessary. If you're starting from square one, like, God bless my wife. Hell, she found my creative director sweater. She found this one for me. Look at that. See, supporting in all kinds of ways. But we had a sit down conversation and we're like, listen, if all of my jobs, I've done retail sales, I've done corporate sales, I've done like over the phone stuff and uh, you know, I, for decades, that's what I did. And I never liked any of it, never liked it, never liked retail. I was good at it, but I never liked it. Um, but the one thing I've always did like was creativity. And I love video games. I love uh, board games and you know, card games. and. I grew up with, I mean, hell, look at my freaking office, man. I got Halo and Metal Gear posters. Like, I have an arcade cabinet, for God's sakes. So, like, I live and breathe it. I have since I was five. Same thing, I would draw Spider-Man since I was five. And then, once you get to a certain age, you have to ask yourself, okay, what's the thing that you're going to regret the most on your deathbed? And I, I'm such a big fan of the creative arts. And I've always thought there's a business there. I've always thought there's a way to make money. There's a way to make a living. And there's proof. And you want to know how I know there's proof? Because video games are a freaking billion dollar a year industry. Anime is a freaking billion dollar. Like people are writing books left and right. People are putting up. I mean, look at your favorite movie. Go watch your favorite movie and do not skip the credits. Read those credits. Creative director. Uh, like Matt Painters. Visual effects supervisor. All that stuff. Read those names. There are hundreds of names. Why not you? Why not you? I don't know. And it was almost like a clarity thing. And it sounds really weird saying it was clarity and then I'm gonna take a huge massive price cut. But um, if you're a fan of the of the <laughs> of of the show and of the channel and stuff, you're gonna know I have a two month old baby boy. So really, whenever we crunch the numbers, me staying at home with the baby saves about a thousand dollars a month on daycare so if i'm bringing home whatever you know um and just let's say i make 15 grand a year if i'm bringing home whatever you know a little over a thousand bucks a month if we're saving another thousand dollars by not doing uh daycare and child care expenses for a newborn now add that into the salary you know what I mean? Like if we're saving money, that's money not spent. That's money earned, in my opinion. So I know it's not where I want it to be. Um, the reason why I keep pushing and I keep grinding and I have so many different things set up is one of these things is going to stick. 
Um, it might be YouTube, I don't know. But we're going to talk about that in another question upcoming here in a little bit. Um, it's got to work. It's got to work. It's um, literally I, I took the boat and then whenever I landed, I burned the boat. Like I blew up the bridge while I was still standing on it. Like there's no way it can't work. Now, I, had, I know how my mind works. So I had to do that. I had to be like, all right. We're starting from square one. I have 15 plus years of time to make up for. If I want to do this, I'm doing this day in, day out, no days off. Let's go. Let's figure it out. And I still have that. I have that every single day. Like when I'm recording stuff like this, whenever I'm painting, I feel more at peace than I ever did doing a retail job or, you know, working at the college or whatever. And I love some of those people. I love the jobs. I love that type of thing. But those weren't me. They just weren't. Uh, but now I'm old enough, I'm wiser, if you could consider leaving a fully paid health insurance job wise. Um, I think it is. No regrets, man. Um, so right now, technically, it is not a sustaining career. Not just on my salary alone. No way. Um, but having good support systems in place. So if that means you're working a 40 hour a week job and you do art on the weekends or at night or what have you, your progress might be slower, but hell, you're doing it. You're absolutely doing it. Um, there, there's the old saying, the only bad sketchbook is an empty one. You just gotta put in the time, make it happen. Like, wake up early, set the alarms. Like, if, if, if you're really serious about making it the career, make it a career. If you're spending 40 hours a week doing something you hate, why not spend double that doing something you love? I don't know. To me, it makes sense. Um, it's not for everybody. I'm not telling everyone to go quit their job. Like, I know Conan O'Brien did an old, uh, he did an article for Vanity Fair or something. It was a short story about how everybody just decided to become a podcaster. Like, farmers stopped farming. Um, no nurses existed anymore. Everyone was just going to be a podcaster. Like, the world takes all types of people. But just know you're no less of an artist if you're not doing it professionally. I want that to really sink in. Just because you do not do art for a career, or you're not at the place that you want to be for art as your career, does not make your artistic voice, or you as an artist, any less than anybody else. I'll fight anyone who says otherwise. Like, hell, Van Gogh made, what, eight paintings in his life? He had other shit to do, man. <laughs> or no, no, he made a lot of paintings, but he only did it for like eight years of his life, or something. Uh, so, who who cares? Like, if you're making the stuff, if you love it, if that's what you want to do, go for it. But the moment you flip that switch and you want it to become a job, it's got to become a job. Like, I love doing it. I can't imagine. I will never go back to sales. I will never go back to stuff like that. This is what I'm going to do till the day I die. Guaranteed. Because I found it. I found the thing. Oh, I loved it since I was a little kid. I love it even more now. I have a deeper appreciation. But now that means I get to work. You gotta work, man. You know, amateurs wait for motivation, professionals get to work. That's a saying, a lot of golden sayings in this one. But I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, money's tight, but money has to be tight right now. It just has to be. Um, we're gonna we're gonna make it. That that grind is gonna happen, and we're gonna work forward, and we're gonna push forward, and we're gonna. You know, we got some big things on the horizon that I one of them I can talk about in December. Um, but who knows? Who knows where it goes? Life's crazy, man. You got to do some stuff. I don't know. <laughs> but thank you, Andrew, for the great, um, the great question. And moving on, also on Twitter, uh, Cybernetic Phoenix um, has, says, Hey, Wes, uh, do you have some advice on how to improve speed on digital art? For a little while, uh, I've been polishing skills and have been leveling up my detail game and stuff like that, but one area where I feel I need a lot of work on is my speed. I'm just a hobbyist, so no worries for work. So, my thoughts on this is, what would you get out of being faster? But like, what, what would be the thing? Is it just because you see a lot of time lapses on there, or some people are at a certain high level, they can knock out like, Oh, Ian McKay can do a genius looking thing in 20 minutes. Or Nathan Fox can do the best watercolor landscape I've seen in 10 seconds. 
um, those people are dynamos. They're virtuosos, right? And it's amazing to see. But whenever, especially as a hobbyist, um, I would say quality over quantity. Um, now it's kind of pot calling the kettle black type thing, like do as I say, not as I do, because I did the opposite. I will set timers. I do that type of stuff because if I feel like I'm making up for lost time for 15 years of not touching a pencil, not drawing, not anything, and now I want to make this my full-time career, I need to have the expedited Rosetta Stone version of how to be an artist at a certain level, quickly, fast, I gotta get it, right? I mean, two-month-old baby won't feed itself, you gotta pay for that formula. So I have to work fast, I have to. So some of the techniques that I use, um, really they come down to fundamentals. I'm spending more time on the first parts of my images and it's speeding up the second half. So that's why I'm a very big fan of the Im Impasto, very thick brush, Art Rage, Rebel sort of look um, with natural brushes and things like that. And why I'm doing oil paintings now and all that is like, I want to see if I can just paint some stuff, put some stuff on a canvas and then be like, what does this look like to me? Oh, I can make it look like blam, 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 and move the paint around, and now I have a picture. I think that's an interesting, energetic way to go. I'm not great at drawing. Drawing, I feel like I have to be very delicate and dedicated and stuff, and I just don't, <laughs> I feel like I don't have time for that. So I'm like, how can I make the biggest impact possible? So big shapes, um, simplify your designs. So what I see a lot of amateur um, artists or hobbyist artists do which is totally fine. I'm not going to tell you one way or another. Like, do the art that speaks to you and you really enjoy doing. Because you're going to get the best results. And you're going to get faster at whatever your technique is. You're going to get faster. Um, but what I do see is the younger artists, hobbyist artists, will try to get details very, very quickly. I would say don't even do details. Don't do gestures. Do big blotches of light and you know contrast and shapes and um there, there's a thing and i'm actually writing something that i'm going to release in the next month or so um about the four kind of main pillars of interesting art um and the acronym's easy to remember because it's uh crap c-r-a-p have good contrast have repetition of shapes make sure your alignment makes sense on your where things are and the proximity of key items to each other. It's very much a graphic designer's way of thinking, but if you remember those contrast, repetition, alignment, and proximity, you're going to make interesting pictures. It's just uh, so cut back from all the detail, really focus on your overall idea. Do sketches, thumbnails, um, big brushes. Use a brush way bigger than you're comfortable with. You're going to start making different decisions. And then what you're going to notice is the stuff that you're thinking you're taking a long time on now, you're going to get faster at. Um, just, it's time. Once again, we're going to talk a lot about time. It's just time under the gun. It's time under the pencil. It's time under whatever it is. Just, um, yeah, just put in that time and you're going to notice yourself solve problems at a faster rate. And that's just going to lead to an overall better result. So I hope that helps. Um, so thank you, Cybernetic, uh, for sending that one in. Appreciate you very much. Um, now we're getting over to Vreep. Um, Indraw691, good pal Vreep, um, on Twitter saying, I've seen your works in many of your videos. I am wondering, what is your day like? Uh, do you do art stuff every day? And how do you keep yourself motivated to do art? So we'll answer that last one first. Um, eating food is a pretty good motivation. <laughs> but that's how I have to do it, because if I was still working another gig... And like, yeah, I guess I'll be a good artist one day. I would never do it. I would never do it. Dude, I have a thousand games to play on Steam. I got, you know what I mean? I have all this stuff just waiting around. And I'm like, oh, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. And sadly, art was that way for 15 years. So now I'm like, my motivation is I got to go. This is how we're going to pay the bills. I got to pay, a, you know, help pay a mortgage. And that that's motivation. That lights a fire under your butt very, very quickly. Um, And plus, it's just... I enjoy getting better at something to see my technical skill go up and improve is always a lot of fun. 
Um, but let's see. I'm wondering what your day is like. So um, I wake up whenever baby lets me wake up. <laughs> you know, now my wife's going back to work. She's a school teacher. So my, my schedule is going to be changing. But like right now, it is 1145 at night and they're both in bed. Um, I usually work until about 3 a.m. Um, usually from the 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. is when I get a big amount of work done. Whenever I do my recordings, my time lapses, um, any sort of um, pain over stuff. If I work with students, I give them feedback. If I have client work, I email them. So like, you know, let's see, 9, 10, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2. So I, only, I do about nine hours worth of work in five hours. So once again, work fast. I gotta, you know, gotta get good communication. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Um, just be open, just be, you know, these are my desk hours. Um, but I'll also have stuff open throughout the day. So if I'm feeding baby, um, you know, I can have email open. If somebody emails me, put baby on the shoulder, type back, um, I have Discord open, um, I reply to YouTube stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, I just find time. Um, I'm always at the computer, whether I'm gaming, whether I'm answering stuff for work, whether I'm doing a painting, I'm always here. Like I legitimately kind of live here. It's sort of sad. We have this beautiful house and I never see it. Um, but that's what has to be done. I mean, that's just how, that's how I work. Um, do you do art stuff every day? Yes, absolutely. Even if it's like a 30 minute sketch or painting or something, I try to do, make a thing every single day. Um, now what I've started doing is spending more days on one thing, but I'll still put in time on that thing a little bit every day. I feel better whenever I do that. If I don't, I seriously, I get antsy and anxious. If I go to bed knowing I didn't do anything artistic, I feel like I wasted my day. Um, it's probably not healthy, but like, I know that's the thing that I want to do with my life because if I feel bad that I didn't do it for just one day, I know that that's a calling of some sort. You know what I mean? But yes, do art every single day. Um, yeah. And then the motivation stuff, like I said, it kind of speaks for itself and I know it's kind of a non-answer, but really, um, there's so much good art out there and there's so many great artists that I want to learn from that I'm never bored. I never get it kind of in my own head a lot about like, well, you know, man, I just don't have the motivation. I always have the motivation. I just don't have the time. You know what I mean? Like that's where that balance is. But, uh, I hope that helps, uh, basically just carve out a little bit of time every single day and just do the thing it doesn't have to be a ton but just think every 30 minute chunk you do that's closer to hitting your 10,000 hours of mastery or whatever kind of mental um results you go with so thank you for the awesome set of questions um the next set um wero amazing fantasy artist oh my gosh everyone should go follow wero right now amazing amazing stuff like i study a lot of his stuff too um, hey Wes, who are your biggest inspirations? <sighs> How long do we have? We've already been going for 36 minutes. <laughs> you want 36 more just on who I, <laughs> but, uh, God, there's so many, there's so many. And I know that's a trite answer, but like, I'll show you, um, basically if you've ever done art for white dwarf magazine, um, I literally bought this two days ago. I still need to go through a spectrum. Any of kind of the the big names if you name a person and they're well known i'm probably a huge fan of theirs um but specifically if i need to get specifics um inspirations just overall for like career i would say tyler jacobson um tyler jacobson is a beast that guy is unbelievable um also cynthia shepherd she is somebody who now she's kind of head art director at Wizards of the Coast, I think. Her stuff's mind-blowing. She only has like 10 videos up on her YouTube. I'm going to link that. I need to remember to um, in the description. But like, you're going to learn more out of those 10 videos than like five years of art school. <laughs> um, so like brushwork, um, if I want to talk about inspirations for brushwork, definitely Greg Rutkowski. Uh, Gregor Rutkowski, incredible. Um, Jamie Jones. John Park, Lee Shin Yin, um, Dong Lu Yu, um, God, I'm trying to think. Uh, 
God, there's so many names like rattling around my brain. And like, what's amazing now is there's so many great contemporaries. Like, I love the old, like, the uh, Baynard Wu, um, Carl Kapinski, um, Lewis Jones, Igor Sid, um, I should just have my art station open and go through. But, like, there's a lot of incredible, like, gothic y, dark Warhammer artists that I see. Um, but then also on the flip side, you know, people like Sparth. Um, his design sensibility is just second to none. Uh, Daniel Dosi. Oh, I'm going to mess his name up. I can see his last name in my mind. Um, Guild Wars, art director. Um, Paul Canavan. Um, Titus Lunter, Suzanne, like that list is huge. <laughs> um, but if I were to say there's like one artist that I'm kind of looking at and being like, okay, that's the direction I want to go. <sighs> Anthony Jones, maybe? God, there's so many good people. Marco Bucci's good. God, see, I can't pick. I can't pick see what you're doing but I, uh, I hope this goes to show that i'm i'm just a nerd i'm a nerd when it comes to this art thing i love dissecting little bits and pieces from everybody and being like oh how they do that like wero dude your lighting i study it like crazy i'm like how did he get that render like i'm looking at it and i'm like man i need to go in i need to learn i need to <laughs> so that's also how I get motivated is like I'll see just in good Sam Manley are you kidding me we all know Sam Manley like he in my mind's eye now he is Warhammer like fantasy roleplay and Wrath and Glory and like when I think of that I think of him and uh, let's see Miguel Iglesias um, really anybody I, I've worked with like Frost I've worked with so many people um, and see their stuff on the, the Cubicle 7 side ridiculously good ridiculous god they're good story killinger uh stefan rustic is his name but uh phew, man there's so many good artists out there just go into art station and just drool bring a napkin with you because you're gonna drool everywhere man oh man but yeah uh anthony jones oh richard flaptrap sanderson kike kataki see i'm telling you i can <laughs> okay i'm gonna go i'm gonna move on to another thing but just know be a student of the game be a student look at everybody look at everybody look at that i love ethan becker i love a lot of the youtube um you know cynics and uh like i said marco bucci and boro um adam duff you know um yeah tyler edlin i mean there's so many great great artists uh to study from just super super cool stuff great community you know um moving okay so this is our last one but this is like five different questions so I'm going to read through the entire question um, from our good pal Drew here, and then I'm going to answer them one by one because they, they're pretty distinct in this, okay? Let me take a drink real quick. All right, so good pal Drew. I'm going to link his channel as well in the uh, description. So many questions. Um, how do you find a constant supply of clients? Uh, how to write the perfect email. So how would you write the perfect email um, that will get a reply? Do you ever wonder if people will keep and look at your work in two to three hundred years time? Do you see yourself as an artist or a content creator? And finally, when are we going to do this Halo collab? <laughs> so, uh, could do a cool YouTube thing, seeing as we both have channels, which is very true. But yeah, Drew and I have talked about doing... Um, Kind of pushing ourselves to the limit on um i i've been very fortunate to be featured on the halo channel like three different times um for fan art stuff on their community spotlight um and then really getting drew um that that halo confidence to get in there get featured as well so i was like dude let's do a collab Let, let's both make a halo piece and somehow like tie them together and send them both in and see if we make it it's just a fun thing to do builds that community I love the Halo community, so like, hey, the Snickerdoodle and the whole team at 343, so you can see with the Halo Infinite poster right here. I'm a huge fan. So I just love being part of that. Like, having my name kind of synonymous with the fan community of Halo is a huge, I respect it a great deal, and I'm humbled by it all the time. Um, so yeah, we're going to do that soon, once 
I'm going to that first one, all these clients, man, <laughs> got to get the work done. Um, so let's talk about that. How do you get a constant supply of clients? This is going to be a, um, this is actually going to tie in a little bit with the email one about how to write a good email. So it's not up to me if the clients come or not, which is a weird thing to say. So I'm, I'm going to put more of an emphasis on this. It's not up to me if people think my art is good or not. Okay. So a constant supply of clients, I can, I can successfully tell you, I can tell you, and this is no BS out of, let's say 10 of my most recent jobs, I have only emailed two of those clients first, and then they reply back and I get a gig. Otherwise it's people approaching me. It's people uh, seeing either my stuff on ArtStation or Twitter or Instagram or whatever, or maybe even YouTube, and saying, hey, we have this project. We think you might be a good fit. We like what you do. Um, can we talk? There you go. Um, there's the old saying that if you're good at something, you're going to tell everybody. But if you're great at something, they will tell you. And I'm not saying I'm a great artist. I'm just saying that you have to have the mentality. Bust your ass so much all the time just go for it get ready for a prize fight every single day and your work's going to get better and people are, are going to notice the work ethic they're going to want that work ethic on their team period it's just that's how that works is like and now i'll start getting into the email one but they're both related because when i make a cover letter okay now seriously if you take if no one takes anything else from this episode T jot this down. This is my number one piece of business advice ever, ever. Sit in the shoes of the person you're emailing and figure out what they need. What does that mean? So when I make a cover letter for a client or I send an email, I do not say, Hey, I'm this hotshot artist and I made cool stuff and I did a commercial for Adidas, man. Don't you want me on your team? I'm so awesome. You will never get a response because you're just being kind of a jerk. <laughs> but you're never going to get a response because like, who cares? Yeah, like you have a social media thing to brag on. You know what I mean? Like just do that. Like if you want to just hang up your stuff on your mom's fridge, do it. What problem are you going to solve for that client? Think about it in their shoes. I know how hard it is to be an art director. I've never done it before, but I've been in a managerial position and I know that wrangling cats together is a headache. So what I would do is say, hey, I saw this job posting and um, I think my work may be a good fit to help you on your future projects. I'm interested in doing this. I really like doing landscapes. I like doing character work. However, I'm learning how to do this. No pressure. I just want to let you know that I'm available to talk whenever you might need. And then you step back. And then you let the chips fall out. Because what's going to happen, if you're banging on the door all the time, hey, hire me, hire me, hire me. Never think in regards to getting hired. Think in regards to getting an interview. Never, ever, ever on your job resume, on whatever, ask to get the job. Don't ask for the job. It's very hard to hire somebody. It's very easy to talk to somebody. You see what I'm saying? There's a difference in mentality. You have to go in just looking to talk. Hey man, I see you guys have an open for this. I know that my skill set might not be exactly what you need, but I have worked in a few productions that feel kind of similar. Um, I might be off base, but hey, let me know one way or another. I'd love to just sit down and talk about if my skill set can meet the needs of what you might be looking for. And if not, I have a few people in mind as well that I think could also be a cool fit. And I just love to pass their names on to you. That's a way more approachable way than like, oh, I have 40 followers and they all think I'm the best. So you should, blah, blah, you should hire me. Like, don't, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> I'm not saying you do, but like, I see, I see that mentality. People are like, oh, I know I'm a perfect fit for this job. They're going to hire me. They're going to see my, my credentials and my resume. Oh man, I got this in the bag. 
and then get bummed out when they don't hear a reply back. It's like, well, you didn't phrase it in a way to solve their problem. You phrased it in a way to self-serve yourself and add a big client to your resume. And that's not the intent. I'm just as maybe even more excited to work with the little guy than I am to work with the big conglomerate, mass media, whatever. Because on the, on the big, big side, I know I'm a cog in the machine. I fully understand that. And I, I fit the need of what I need to do. I don't need to really go above and beyond. That's not what they're looking for. They're looking for somebody. Can you hit this deadline? Can you do this prompt? Can you paint this well? Can you do this? Yes or no? No? Sorry, we don't need you. Yes? Okay, let's try it. But whenever you're working with a smaller client, you have more of an open communication. You have more of a, hey, I know you said you liked it kind of like this. I mean, I'm literally right now explaining how I work with Guildhouse Games and Varia for the card stuff. Hey, like, I know we talked about this mood, but what would you think about something like this? I was just messing around with the colors and I thought, you know, well, if we talked about nighttime and the weird like red moon, what if we did this? If not, I'll still keep going on this track, but I want to let you know I was thinking about this. What do you think? Then it's going to get the art team's juices flowing. Ooh, that's a cool idea. And maybe what we could do is blah, blah, blah. It's an open communication. It, it People try to make it so cut and dry, and it's not. You're all in it together. You're on the same team. You want this stuff to be successful. I've even told clients, this is true. I've told clients I'm not the right fit for their job. I've said no to work. I'm like, guys, you will not be happy with what I make you. I am not a character designer. I cannot design characters for the life of me. If you have a character that you already made and you need something on spec, but you need them in a pose or in a situation or like storytelling, I'm your guy. I cannot create a character. They're going to be the most generic, boring ass character you've ever seen because my mind doesn't work that way. I can't make cool engrossing. That is not my skill set. It's not it. Get a character designer, get a graphic designer, get someone to make your logo, get whatever. I've turned away clients because they're like, oh, you do visual art. Can you make my logo? No, because I'd make a crappy logo. <laughs> but here's five people that I know that make logos. Take your pick. So it's about giving work. It's about realizing what you're strong at and not taking anything else. Now you should stretch a little bit. And yeah, maybe I haven't done a lot of concept art, but hey, if you'd like, some landscape concepts, maybe I could do some. And then it's up to them. They can say yes or no. If they want to take a chance on you, great. If not, totally understandable. You have to respect the process. It's a business. At the end of the day, we're in it either to make money or make dreams come true or like give people some relief from the stress of the world around us. So everybody needs, needs to be on the same page. And I think that's very mission critical of... Don't get into the whole art thing thinking you're going to be some big rock star or hotshot artist. That's really self-serving, and that leads to a lot of really toxic things, um, as we've seen time and time again in the art industry. I won't go further into that, but you'll know, you know what I'm talking about if you know. Um, okay, so do you ever wonder if people will keep and look at your art two to three hundred years from now? Not once. <laughs> Which is bad. But here's, okay, two things about that. One... I don't think any of my stuff is up to that level to be studied like that yet. I haven't really made that. My, my goal is to make something that stands the test of time. I'm there to solve a temporary problem to the best of my ability. Now, if I make something that does entice repeat viewings or whatever, I consider that a huge success. Because like I said before, I don't think about... I don't... I can't judge if my art is good or not. My part of this equation is just to make the thing. Just make it. Just make it and put it out there. Um, it's not up to me. I, I just make the stuff. If I think it looks cool, I put it out there. If not, I scrap it, start over, do another thing. Like My part of this equation is just to produce. I produce stuff. Um, now I know what I like. I know what I like to look at. I'm not at the level that where I think I should be or need to be or could be. But if if my art resonates, that's a bonus for me. Primarily, I need my art director to be happy. I need uh, my client to be happy. 
Um, I need to be fulfilled enough with like, okay, I gave that one my all. And then after that, you know, whatever happens, happens. It's out there in the ether. It doesn't belong to me anymore. You know, um, do you see yourself as an artist or a content creator? Great question. Artist. If YouTube went belly up tomorrow, if Twitch went belly up, if social media was gone, I would still paint every single day of my life till the day I die. The content, who cares? Like the whole idea that, that, that the, the production stuff and things like this, and sure, this is content, but primarily my intent for stuff like this isn't to be like, oh, I'm the best and people need to watch me. I want to help people, man. I know what it's like to be in a career that you don't like as much and that you feel like you're wasting your time and what do I do with my life and how do I get better at this crazy art thing and ah, I don't understand. I'm with you. Like that's my intent for this is not to become some multi-billionaire. It's like, hey, I want to build a community of like-minded individuals that are in this really tricky thing called art and visual communication together. Um this is just a platform to do it. It's a big platform. It's easy to make videos. YouTube makes it fairly easy to get up and going and started. And then I already have a Twitter and stuff. So it all kind of makes sense. But like making content, I used to think that way back when I did Twitch full time in like 2014. Um, and I was miserable. I was miserable because I wasn't doing it for anything but clout. And the moment you're trying to do a thing just to be self-serving, like get out of here like people can see through that a mile away but if you're genuinely here to help if you're here to give insight if you're here to maybe put a voice to maybe some of the murmurings in somebody's mind and be like hey it's okay we've all been there we all know how stressful this whole thing can be just to be some sort of guide um i always make the metaphor about bowling where you have the the, the pads on the side like whenever i work with students this is what i always tell them my job is not to make you paint like me. My job is to put these bouncers on the side. That way you're always moving forward. Whatever your voice looks like, whatever your goals are, I want to make sure you get there to the best of your ability and learn from all my mistakes. So whatever I provide, just take it. Just listen to it. Don't listen to it. Once again, all I can do is, is provide information it's up to the individual to see if it works for them or not. Um, that's a way healthier way to go about it because if you're trying to make all things for all people, you made something for nobody. Um, but yeah, artist through and through, through and through. I would I would do stuff if no one ever saw it. I would make stuff yeah till the day I die. Um, finally, yeah, when do you want to do the Halo collab? Soon. We'll do that one soon. Um, probably in the next month or so. But I'll DM you. I'll DM you, brother. <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. We'll, we'll get there and we'll holler out to Snickerdoodle. Tell her that we're on our way. So, uh, But that's it for episode number one in the can. Look at that. 56 minutes. Ooh, some mwah, mwah, juicy answers. Hopefully you found something that you like. Uh, just know time is your most valuable resource. Use it in the way that you find most productive. Um, whether that's relaxing and enjoying other people's art or doing master studies or working from imagination or photo bashing, or learning 3D, or playing music, whatever you got, whatever is the thing that calls to you on a daily basis, do that and I guarantee your life will be more enriched. I make a third less than I did from my previous job and I'm three times happier doing it. So at the end of the day, I hope this might inspire or motivate or maybe put some sort of direction on the craziness that is being a creative person and trying to put your foot in the door, either professionally or as a hobbyist or as an amateur. Um, but I can't wait to do another one of these. I love answering questions. I love teaching. I love that sort of um, give and take and we all learn together. And like, I, I'm all about that. So please send in more questions. Um, of course, patrons are going to get first dibs. Whatever question you have, just give me a shout out and be like, hey, I want this in the next episode. Uh, we can move forward with that. And all the links to everything is going to be in the description. Like I said, the Patreon is $1 a month forever. I'm never going to raise the price. I'm always going to deliver at least one post with something, whether it's a PSD file or brushes or something, paint overs um, every month. Um, I'm fairly busy now, but I'm still going to make it a point to at least post some stuff, check in with everybody. But please, 
uh, sign up there, get on the Discord. Um, we'll hang out, we'll chat a little bit. Um, yeah, hang out on YouTube here, ask me on Twitter. Got an Instagram and stuff. I got all sorts of stuff going on. I don't know. <laughs> but you can check the links in the description below. But thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you for uh, the incredible first edition questions that we got. And thank you for all the support. We're almost at 2,000 subscribers here on YouTube, which is unbelievable. Seeing my bald creative director mug just answering questions and painting like a freak. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Um, <laughs> it's amazing. But I, I thank all of you uh, for that, for all the support. It's incredible to meet all of you and be able to work with you and answer questions and just figure this art thing out. You know, it's a lot of fun. But until we meet again, send in those questions and we'll talk to you soon. Peace.